Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our risen and ascended Savior. Now what? Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Maybe it's the thought or the question of the student or the graduate who finally enters that first day of summer vacation or maybe the end of their schooling and they wake up the next morning and they roll out of bed and they think to themselves, now what? Or maybe it's the question of the young couple who brings their newborn home and sits there on the couch looking at that infant and they look at each other and say, now what? Or maybe it's the question of the person who faces a sudden or unexpected experience that kind of flips their lives upside down and they now look at each other and they think to themselves, now what? As Jesus' disciples stared up into the sky, 40 days after Jesus had risen from the dead, and they saw their ascended Savior now remove his visible presence from them, a Savior that they had spent the last three years with, that question may have run through the disciples' minds. Now what? Peter was one of those disciples who stood there as an eyewitness to Jesus' ascension. And he knew from firsthand experience what it was like to be a follower of Jesus, both before Jesus' ascension and after Jesus' ascension. He knew what it was like to be a follower of Christ. The difficulties and dangers, the blessings and the comforts, the challenges and the struggles that came from being a follower of Jesus. And so this morning, I would invite you to listen to those words of Peter. The words that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write to his fellow Christians of his day and that the Lord chose for us to hear on this morning. Because they are words that equip us and get us ready for the now what's of our life. Peter writes, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you. And make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. As I began preparing for this sermon, I realized how often we separate these verses one from the other. Think about it. How many of you have memorized these individual verses? Probably a significant number of you. You maybe have quoted them or had them quote to you. And yet, when you look at them, you might be a little surprised to find that they're all right there, one after the other, right in the same context, if you will. And although we might quote these as individual verses, and certainly rightfully so, because each of those verses could be a sermon in and of themselves, But don't worry, this sermon isn't going to be three times as long as usual. We are going to look at this entire section because I I want you to see how the thoughts flow one into the other and maybe even gain a greater appreciation for these truths that the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Peter to write for us. Peter begins by saying, "'Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand.'" that he may lift you up in due time. Where does humility come from? Humility usually comes from acceptance. Accepting the one who is guiding and directing you, the one who is telling you where to go and what to do. For us as Christians, that humility comes from accepting the Lord's will and his ways for us and our lives, even when we might not completely understand it. The Lord answers our prayer for healing with, not right now. 
the Lord allows you to endure some sadness at the loss of property or the loss of maybe even loved ones. The Lord allows disappointment to come into your life when you see somebody break a promise to you or when you go through a relationship that has now been shattered or broken. The Lord allows you to fail at something that you thought was a really good idea. And when you go through experiences like that, what is usually the first question that pops into your mind? It's the short and sweet question of why. Why would a loving Lord allow me to go through this as one of His children? And sinful pride likes to jump in there. Sinful pride likes to jump in and and provide for you the soapbox to stand on and wag your finger at God's face and lecture God about how things ought to be going. But when you are tempted to stand on that sinful pride, remember what the Lord said to the Old Testament believer Job when his sinful pride got the best of him. The Lord said to Job, Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who shut up the sea behind doors? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? In other words, God comes to Job and says, Who do you think you are? Dear friends, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. Now when you first read that, it might sound like God finds some enjoyment by heavy-handedness, that he's the cause of our discomfort or our suffering, that, that he's just sitting back there in heaven and kind of enjoying watching his creatures squirm under his heavy hand. But remember what God's mighty hand has done for you. This is the mighty God who, after creating the entire universe... And watching the creatures that he had made, which were supposed to bring him glory, and then ruined it. This is the mighty God who thousands of years later took the form of one of his creatures. Who was born as a child and lived as you and I live. This is the mighty God who never pushed away a single soul, but welcomed all to come and hear and learn of the salvation that He entered this world to bring to them. This is the mighty God who lived a perfect life under the same laws and restrictions that you and I live under and then willingly allowed himself to be nailed to a cross in order to win salvation for us. This is the mighty God who has now ascended into heaven, declaring his victory over sin, death, and the devil who now has resumed full use of his divine power and is using it all for your eternal blessing, for the good of his people. There are certainly certain situations in our life where there are very humbling circumstances, such as when you realize that you're not in control of things. When you realize that you can't fix all the things that maybe that you've brought upon yourself or somebody else has brought into your life. When you don't completely understand exactly why the Lord would allow this or that to happen to you. But then remember what the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, what he also wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he observed the world around him, And even he could not at all times understand why certain things happened. Finally, he came to this conclusion. He simply said, trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You see, humility pushes to the side sinful pride that wants to demand answers from God. And humbly accepts the Lord's will and ways for your life. Trusting that that mighty God will use everything for your eternal good and that one day he will. He will lift you up in due time. Yes, the very real sadness and suffering of this life will not go on forever. 
even though at times I understand it might feel like it's going on for way too long when you're the one going through it. And yet the mighty Lord says that one day he will lift you up and he will lift you away from all the pains and problems of this life to be by his side in the glory of heaven. So now what? They're still here. Well, the Lord says that throughout this life, that he invites us to come and make use of this wonderful invitation that he makes through the Apostle Peter. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You think about how often we get worn down and weighed down by the worries of this life. Foolishly thinking that everything depends upon us, that we've got to figure it out and we've got to fix it all. Now don't get me wrong. I'm in no way saying that we should be fatalistic or that we should employ the, the reggae philosophy of don't worry, be happy, I'm sure everything's going to work out. Okay? No. This is not God's promise to just try to ignore the problems of life or pretend like they don't exist. This is so much better. This is the promise of a mighty God who loves you perfectly, who has said, come and find peace as you lean upon my never-failing promises. How often does worry rob us of that peace that God intends for us to have as his people? as we rely upon his promises. How often does worry paralyze us, causing apathy or inactivity? Maybe you can think of it like the, the farmer who goes out into his field each and every day and yet never plants a single seed because he worries that it might rain too much or too little, it might be too cold or too hot, and so he ends up not doing anything at all. The case can be similar for individual Christians or even a Christian congregation who is constantly consumed by worry and the what-ifs so that all of a sudden you start to miss out on the opportunities to serve the people around you and to be blessed through that service. That you miss out on the opportunities to, to be what God has called you to be, bearers of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, take the Lord up on his invitation. And don't let worry rob you of that peace or cause inactivity, but rather lay those worries on the Lord, for he has invited you to. And find strength in his faithfulness and in his promises. And as you do so, watch out. Watch out because as Peter reminds us, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I'd be interested. Have any of you ever been to a petting zoo where there's a lion? If you have, don't go back, okay? Not a very good idea. I have yet to find that petting zoo where you go and you pet a lion. It's not a good idea. Because as hard as Disney movies try to make lions out to be cute and cuddly, Real lions are really dangerous. I think I'm stating the obvious, right? Well, the devil is real. And he is just as dangerous, if not more. The devil is spiritually dangerous to us. He, he has only one goal, no matter how hard he may try to convince you otherwise, and that is to devour you. That is to rip you away from your Savior and to rob you of all the blessings that come from being connected to that Savior. And how does the devil try to do that? Well, once again, there's those words, sinful pride. The devil tries to lull us asleep, to intoxicate us with our own sinful pride. Sinful pride that tries to convince you that, eh, the devil, he's not all that dangerous. Sin can't be all that bad. I mean, look at me. I'm sinning right now. Nothing bad is happening to me. In fact, it seems to be making me more popular and successful. It's sinful pride that looks at other people's failures and falls and says, that would never happen to me. I am too strong. And before you know it, there you are walking in the spiritual petting zoo with the lion, the devil, roaring and prowling around you. Dear friends, watch out. Resist him. 
standing firm in the faith. Stand up against the devil by standing firmly on the truths of God's word so that when the devil leads, lives up to his name, that of liar, and he tries to convince you to doubt and question God's goodness and his will for you, that you can point him to the truths of God's word where God has declared you to be a fully forgiven child of his, washed of every one of your sins. That you can go to those truths of God's word and you can point the devil to the fact that God is faithful to all that he says. That you can go there and show him how God has demonstrated his mercy to you time and time again. That you have the ascended Christ with all of his power working on your behalf and protecting and providing for you. And then always remember, The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. One final question. Do you like to wait? I have yet to see the hospital that advertises long waits in the waiting room. Come here. It doesn't happen. We would much rather go to the doctor, get that test or whatever it is, and get home, right? And yet, if you know that what you are waiting for is really good, then we're willing to wait. And we say that the wait is worth it. Dear friends, no matter what you're going through in this life, no matter how long or short the wait may seem, Know that what the Lord has given to you through faith and promised to you through faith that one day you will experience. And that is the glory of heaven. As we wait, humbly accept the Lord's will for your life, trusting that the one who gave his life for you will use everything in your life for your eternal good. Stand strong against those attempts those temptations of that roaring lion, the devil, as you daily unload your cares and your worries on the Lord so that you are not weighed down, but that you are ready to take on that devil each and every day. And know that the Lord, who ascended into heaven, will day one day fully restore you as he rescues you to that eternal peace to stand by his side and enjoy the glory of heaven. To him, for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do in the future. Be all glory.